Okay, so for synthesis, well, So, um, request is let's look at problem two from the quiz last time. No, that's good. And then we'll talk about inverted by parts. Um, so, the question is so you have this function here, ft is 3t minus t squared. And it says the problem. Our aim is to find the interval of length three on which the average value of this function is as large as possible. And so for the first little uh, part, I say, find a function that expresses the average value on the interval from x to x plus 3. So 1. If you want to maximize something, you've got to know what it is. What is the average value? Notice that's an interval of length. So I'll say A for average value. This is what do we do? Well, we take the integral of the function on that interval, which in this case is this. Is Sort of intuitively the area of the curve divided by the length of the interval, which is always scary, right? Am I okay with that? Now, what we want to do is we want to maximize this. And what's the tool we always use when we're trying to max in something? I want to take the derivative of this, right? So, I do want to take the derivative of the integral planes. So, let's see, what do we do? We plug in top of fundamental theorem of calculus. Times the derivative of top of the derivative of x plus 3 is 1. Minus plug in bottom, which is 3x minus x squared, the derivative of x. There's your derivative. So, what we got to do is clean this up a little bit. So, I'm going to find the critical points. This is 3x plus 9 minus x squared minus 6x. Minus 9 minus 3x plus x squared. Question. And there is a whole bunch of cancellation here. 9 minus 9 minus x squared plus x squared, 3x minus 3x. And the only thing you're left with is minus six x. So the derivative of this, at the end of the day, is minus two x. Am I okay with that? This makes it fairly easy. What what critical numbers do you see? Just see what. Um, 
Now, of course, x can be anything, right? From plus infinity to minus infinity. And so we need to check that this actually gives us a maximum. But if you look, I will assign chart here, there's zero. This is positive here, negative here. So A is increasing and decreasing. So this is a local max. And actually, much more than that, it's an absolute max. Because this function is uh, continuous everywhere. So it goes up forever until it hits zero, then it goes down forever. So not only is that a local max, that's the absolute max. That's as big as it gets. Everybody okay with it? And I think in the last part, I just said, uh, find the interval on which the average value is maximum and get this maximum value. So the interval could be the interval from zero to three. Remember, x equals zero is our starting point. So that should be the interval that gets maximum. And let's find out what it is. A of zero, when you search interval of three, one third, interval from zero to three, of three t minus t squared. So this is one third times three halves t squared minus one third t cubed. Evaluate it from zero to three. Of course, by putting zero, I'm going to get zero. This is one third of 27 halves minus nine. So it's going to be 18 halves, so it's going to be nine halves. A third of that is three. There's the maximum average value. Sorry, maximum average value. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's look at uh, another example. Before we do that, there's some parts. This is a, uh, I want to kind of reemphasize this. This is kind of a good going back to the well problem. What if I ask you to do this? This problem. This illustrates, I, I do this problem here to illustrate uh, the value of a little bit of person. What do you think? Anybody got an idea for um, substitution? Well, the good thing, again, the thing about substitution is there's only a small number of obvious things to try. Right? And, you know, we've seen some examples where someone can see the plug or into some kind of uh, outlet in the substitution, but this one isn't look very good. That's a good place to start. Right? So, That's you, and I need seven more of these to do. So I can use seven of these, then I just kind of get one of those. Try something else. Oftentimes, Bob's fractions and self radicals, arguments of things like sine, cosine, exponential. Okay, so maybe I want to go this way. Try this. Can you 
is three x squared x. Now, this is looking also not that great because I've got this cover. This is you. But now, I've got x to the a. How can I cover that? Persevere. The difference here is this eats up an awful lot of power. This is eating up a much smaller amount of power. So you've got a point here. Let's let's take one further step here. This gives me an idea about how I might break this up. I'm not doing the substitution yet. But let me let me point out that I've got an x cube plus one on the bottom, and I can reserve two powers. This is going to be like one third du, and how many powers of x do I have left over? Got six left over. Got to deal with something. So I can deal with this. This is one third du. Again, this is u. But what about the x to six? We can get integration by parts. So we're uh, oftentimes the things you're assuming if you stop here that you only use u one time, and certainly we use it to set up the bottom. But you can go back to the well. Let me point out another way to write this equation is x cubed equals u minus one. How does that help? It'll be three. You need square of And now we've got it. This is u minus one squared. At least we've successfully put everything that is cubed into an x. So this becomes u minus one squared, one third. So this is the interval of one third squared minus two thirds u plus one third over the two. Just multiply this thing out and multiply it uh, one third. This becomes one third u minus two thirds plus uh, one third over u. Writing each of these pieces the same. Everybody okay? So now we're in. in so if I can integrate all this, this is going to be uh, one sixth squared times two thirds u plus one third third at the log absolute value u plus constant. So all I've got to do at this point is go back in. What was u? It's an x two plus one plus six. X cubed plus one squared minus two thirds. X cubed plus one plus one third natural log absolute value of X cubed plus one.
So there's a moral to the story. Sometimes your use substitution can be more versatile than just shoving something in for you. We played around with it here and found that it was more utilitarian that allowed us to cover this. So don't be afraid to go back to the well and relook at your use substitution and see if it's doing more for you than it, you think it is. Okay. So, when we talked about, when we did new substitutions, this, as I pointed out, sort of undoes complicated messages created by the chain rule. And here's an easy complicated mess. This is an example from last time. This is not equal to the two cats. Right, because the derivative of e to the two x is e times two x times two. So the chain rule actually prevents you from doing what you would hope would be easiest, and the the antiderivative of this is actually equal to one half e to the two x. Plus constant if you wish. And it was a substitution u equal 2x that basically undoes the chain rule and solves this puzzle for us. We did more, more complicated examples. But really, what you substitutions do is they untangle the chain rule if things are set up. Right? Now, there's one other technique of integration. So when you're in 1080, you will probably do a chapter in the book that says techniques of integration. So they'll talk about trig substitutions, they'll talk about uh, partial fractions, they'll talk about integration. Uh, partial fractions is just an output to it. It's basically a more sophisticated version of this step right here. It deals with quotients and polynomials, right, in a systematic way. It's an output to it. Trig substitutions are actually a special case of use substitutions that we did uh, just yesterday. Uh, there's really only other one really different technique of integration, and it's called integration by parts. And what parts does is just like U substitutions untangle the chain rule. Parts untangles the product rule, uh, and it's useful in some situations. So let me give you a motivating example. Frustrating, perhaps. What's the antiderivative of x e to the x? Or, say, x squared cosine. Or say natural log x. What are the antiderivative? See, this is frustrating because at least in the first two, these are both things where I know what the antiderivatives are, right? I know what the antiderivative of x is separately. I know what e to the x is, that's easy. But when I put them together in a product, I'm not sure. I know what the antiderivative of x squared is. It's one third x cubed, right? I know the antiderivative of cosine x is sine x, right? But when there's a product, is the antiderivative of this one third x cubed sine x? No way. And the problem is it's a product because the derivative of this actually has two pieces, right? It's the derivative of this, so it's x squared sine x, and that doesn't even match, minus one-third, uh, plus one-third x cubed cosine x. You do not get back to there. So something else is going on, right? You can't just integrate both of these. Please don't do that. Don't integrate the top and bottom of a fraction. Don't integrate the pieces in a product. How do we get to the bottom of these things here? Well, 
it's basically based on the product rule, and it's it's a simple thing. So when I show you the derivation, you'll think, well, that is really easy. But surprisingly, this integration by parts is a great hail mary. Right? When you really can't figure out anything else to do, the parts often surprisingly works in a lot of situations. So suppose I have a product with two functions, f of x and x. And suppose I take the derivative of it. Now going back to 1040, I know how to take the derivative of this animal. It is f prime of x, g of x, plus f of x, g prime of x. And of course, the fact that we have to have a product rule is the reason that this thing is the antiderivative. So the product rule is something different. Okay. So let me kind of cosmetically rewrite this. Uh, notice that I want to key on this here. F of X is equal to um, instead of D, DX, I'm just going to put a big prime. Yes. Right? If I take this over the other side, I get derivative of this minus this. This, right? So, if these two are equal, let's just integrate both sides and see what it shakes out. So, we look at f of x, prime of x, this is equal to f of x, g of x. All prime minus f prime of x of x. So the interval of f of x g prime of x of x is the integral of this. What is the integral of f of x, g of x prime? So, there's nothing too deep here. Let's call this function bill, right? What did we do? We take the derivative of bill, then we integrate. What happens? What happens if you take the function, take a derivative, and then you integrate it? Right. Could be by constant. We're, 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 we're going to make that. So if you do something like take uh, x squared, right, take its derivative, you get 2x, then you integrate it again, you're back to x squared, right? That's the point of the fundamental theorem of calculus, it's your inverse operation. Take derivative, take the antiderivative, and you're back where you started, up to it. So I'm going to let the constant be absorbed. This is f of x g of x minus And this is the integration of parts of this. And you might say, we did this in sense so far. I wouldn't blame you. But let's see. Let me sort of, let me do this heavy handed so you can see the magic. See, what this says is, if I can do this problem, and you can write it as a function times another function's derivative, you can rewrite my problem just by saying, well, it's this function times g of x minus the derivative of that times g of x. So see how we've gone from here to here. There's a role reversal, right? Here, it's g's derivative that's been taken. Here, it's f's derivative. Great. So what good is that? Well, here's, here's what uh, the deal is. Suppose... And this problem, I'll write it over here. I'm supposed to do it this way. And after I did, it's kind of long winded. 
version to show you what it works. Imagine, uh, I'll give you some practical computing. Suppose this is f of x, and suppose this is g prime of x. So f of x is x, and g prime of x is d x, right? So what's g of x? Right, it's just the antiderivative of dx, which is dx plus some constant. We'll ignore that just for now. Well, let's see what the Hertz formula says. This is f of x times g of x, which is x plus dx, minus the interval of the role reversal. What's that prime of x? The root of x, one. So now what we have is one times e to the x. And this I can integrate. So the answer should be x e to the x minus e to the x. Fantastic. We untangled this product rule. And got this. And you can, again, you can check your derivative because the derivative of this is this times the derivative of this, which is my x e to x. And then it's the derivative of x times e to x. So you've got e to the x minus e to the x. So you take this derivative. It is very common in doing u substitutions to do this this way. Um, And so what you have is u is f of x, du is f prime of x of x, dv, g prime of x of x, and v, g of x. And so here's kind of a standard shortcut notation uh, for parts. U D V is U V minus the interval of D D. This is exactly what's important here because U V is F of X G of X and V D U is uh, F prime of X G of X. So there is your integration by parts. Let's try some of this. Now, I want to implement this formula here. And so, when I decide to myself, hey, you know what, I'm going to try parts here, I divide this up into parts. Now, here is my rule of thumb for your DV part, the part that you have to figure out the antiderivative. I usually select from that the most complicated, the biggest, ugliest piece of that that I can integrate so it's in my head. What is the most complicated piece of this? Well, so you say tomato, I say tomato. Uh, I would say the exponential, actually, uh, because it depends on what you call complicated. And we're going to see why this is a good choice at the moment. Once you've made this selection, and again, with parts, here's the good news about parts. Even more than you substitutions, there's only so many things you can try. Because what you're doing is you're breaking this up into a product of two things, right? So once you've made this choice, that tells you what you should be whatever's left over. Now let me put my money where my mouth is. If u is x squared plus one, what is du? 
And this is really, really need to get these substitutions. Wait till it's the antiderivative of these two x kind of in your head. Ooh, I bet it's e to the two x times something. There you go. Everybody can see how I reverse engineered that derivative of this is e to the two x. So what does parts tell me? Parts tells me this is u v. What's this product here? Minus crossing. Well, it's the product of these V to U. Well, one half cancels two, and I get X E two X. Now, unlike my previous example, I can't just do this in my head, unfortunately. But can, can somebody explain to me why I am better off here than I was here? Here, I have an exponential times a polynomial of degree one. Here, I have an exponential times a polynomial degree one. With a little lag, if I do this one more time, I'll get an exponential by itself. Right? So here, let's do parts again. The biggest, ugliest piece of this that I can do in my head is e to the 2x dx. What's left over is just plain old x. Oh, this is almost the same as last time. So this V is one half e to two x, and the U is x. Better. So this now becomes uh, one half e to the x squared plus one. E to the two x. Uh, don't forget that minus. You got to be real careful with parts because of that minus. Make sure that you're going to put e in here. It should be product of these two x e to the two x. Minus the cross interval. Cross interval this time. Is part of these two, one half of e to the two x. So I get one half x squared plus one e to the two x minus x e to the two x plus uh, an integral of one half. And in my last step here, let's just end up this.
And even though I know the derivative law, that's not going to end up. So if I were to tell you that uh, what we want to do here is parts, take a minute and tell me what do you think the parts should be. What's the biggest ugly piece of this that you can integrate your head? Well, if it was log x, if you could integrate that, then what are you doing parts for? You just write the freaking answer down, right? You've always got this option. That's an option. And actually, it's surprising. The biggest piece, I look at that, I'm like, there's no piece of that. I can do one, and that's it. And which, as you point out, you can't be in the other direction because I absolutely right. Just let you be the, the law. Now, this works miraculously for the following. What is the U point? What's the U point? Make measure of one with six. So this is, by my parts formula, this product here, times the cross interval, and x times 1 over x is just 1. I get x, natural log x, minus x, Uh, the same token, uh, parts is actually Well, let me ask you this. Um, parts. That's what I'm thinking about. I mean, the biggest piece of that that I've been in my head, that's and of course, what I've looked over is go with that. Take a couple minutes to see if you can uh, see if you can ferret that one out.
What's the email? Oh, what's the email? Let's go give me a chunk of this. One half x squared times x plus x minus. Um, I get that one. Oops, yes. That one. What's this? What's Again, remind you the out version of the frame. How many times is x squared going to be one half x squared? What do you got to multiply by x squared to give you that? One half. Do I agree with that? Like one half x squared plus one half. And it's right. That means I can rewrite this crazy fraction as one half minus 
one half over the square root. And again, you can put this over the common denominator, x squared plus one, verify. Can we integrate this? First piece is easy. One half x. What's the second? Minus one half of one. So I can throw in the whole here. So that becomes one half x squared inverse tangent x minus, see we got a little bit of a plus, so it should be minus one half x uh, plus. It's another kind of thing to show up. Universe of parts is happening. You see, this is exponentials times sines, exponentials times cosines, uh, sine of a x, sine of b x. You can't see it that way. It's another thing as well. Let's suppose that I see. Suppose I said let's do this about parts. I always tell you, pick your DB to be the biggest, ugliest so that which you can integrate sort of in different ways. Now I see two pieces. I see an exponential and I see a trade. Actually, I think it's one. But the important thing is to stick to the gun. So Richard, pick for me. You want to use cosine part of the exponential for dv and cosine. Okay. So we'll go cosine of. Oh. Okay. okay. Actually, it doesn't matter. We get the same answer. So, Richard Pick. This is this complicated piece you need to integrate. You just plus it over, right? So somebody tell me what B is. Oh, by the way, I'm going to call this I for integral. What's the U going to be? So my integral, after I've done my first iteration of parts, looks like this. Uh, well, it's going to be one third e to the three x cosine 2x minus minus two-thirds e to the x
equals one third by the way, I've got a lot of advice to give you. This is a problem. We're going to see some two kind of late. What do you think to do with that two thirds of the second interval? What can you do with that two thirds of the second interval? You can pull it out. You can't do it. You don't. I, I, I highly recommend that. I mean, it could be mathematically correct, but you're asking for trouble. Uh, because of the fact that Hart's formula has you know, this product minus this, it's easy to mess things up. I would keep all numbers inside here and treat it with one of these things. So, I, really, I went from e to the x, uh, an exponential term to cosine, an exponential term to sine. What do you want to pick now? Now it matters. You got to stick to your guns. The piece that we used last time to integrate was the exponential of three x. You got to stick to that. So um, I'll do like this: two thirds d dx dx. Stick with your exponential and sines of x. So du is going to be two cosine two x dx. And what's D going to be? What's D going to be? Well, I mean, it's going to be an equal to three x. How do you go from here to here? About by three. I can go out this by three. Now, if you take the derivative, you see that three takes that two nice back down to the place. So, let's see what we get. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, the product of these two. So it's going to be two nice. Uh, e three x sine two x, and then minus the cross. Uh, so it's going to be minus. So it's going to be what four ninths. Uh, e three x cosine two x. Okay, so my team is getting really frustrating now in hand. What's the problem? It's not. So, it's like, right? Because what did I do? <clears throat> I started with e to the 3x cosine 2x, and I got each trusted integration. But now I've got to integrate e to the 3x sine 2x, right? And now look, I'm back to my original problem. I've been yes.
Don't lose sight of the fall of the mind. Don't lose sight of the mind. If this thing, after two steps, is just a rewrite of that original, this is equal to. I agree with that? In fact, remember how I call that I? This is I, the integral of one, and this right here is four ninths of I. Everybody agree with that? So I can rewrite this. Uh, new set of equations, one third e to the three x cosine two x plus two ninths e to the three x sine two x is equal to uh, 13 ninths i. Right, because here's I, our original integral, and here's four ninths of it. When I bring this over here, this could be 13 ninths by. Agree? So I can solve for I is 9 thirteenths times this mess. And so, at the end of the day, I get integral of e to the 3x cosine 2x. The antiderivative of that thing is uh, 3 over 13 e to the 3x cosine 2x plus 2 over 13. Three X sine three X. And this is why I call it chasing your tail because you eventually get back to the problem started up to a constant that you can solve for. Okay. Everybody see that? This is the other kind of big trick that you sometimes see with the integration by parts is when you go through a couple steps and you see what you started with sort of. Let me ask you this. Anybody want to venture a guess as to what would happen? Okay, so Richard, you pick cosine 2x and e three to start the ball rolling. And then we got to the second step where now we've got an exponential point of sign. And I said, oh, well, you better stick to your guns. Anybody want to venture guess what would happen if I hadn't? What if at this point I had let u be 2 thirds e to the 3x and db be sine 2x dx? I mean, mathematically, there's no reason I can't. But anybody want to guess what would happen? What would have happened if you do it, you might try this, is after you do the substitution here, everything cancels out. And you get the equation zero equals zero, which is mathematically correct, but absolutely useless as far as getting any information, right? So what to, if you re reverse the roles here, basically what it does is it's sort of like you tied your shoes and then untied them. That's what happens. You get zero equals zero, and but it's not really useful. So remember, when you do these kinds of problems, always uh, stick to your guns. Okay, any questions? Okay,
Uh, and if, what's this method called? I like. Yeah. Never heard of that before. But if, what does that mean? Yeah, I looked that up for me. I'm, I'm I'm curious what that what the mnemonic device is. So. But usually, what I do uh, for me is I pick I pick my DB. I pick. It's easy to take. Oh, 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 this means like log, uh, what is the app? Oh, there we go. Log inverse algebraic trig. That's probably a reasonable rule of thumb, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't let myself be completely dominated by any sort of somebody's trick, right? But usually what I try to do as a first thing is I look at the ways I can break this up into pieces and it's usually harder to integrate than to take a derivative. So if you see a big piece that you can write down the antiderivative, that's a good sign. And that's usually where I start. Because whatever's left over, that'll be easy to take a derivative. So you wanna you wanna do as much heavy lifting in your head as you can. So I usually pick the part that I have to integrate first. So here's another one. Uh, actually, the first one, this one's not integral parts. This is this is a trick that I'm sure was derived at by some 17th century dude wearing a powdered wig, but not much of a social life. I mean, how do you how do you come up with this? What's an antiprotic secret? Well, it's one over cosine. You're not going to have much luck getting the new substitution done in that order, but here is a clever observation. Look at secant x of theta integral. And instead of just letting it be, multiply this just being the secant tangent. Same pulses for the undefined. Secant x, you multiply by this fraction, which is one, uh, whatever x is not uh, power of two plus two, uh, I k. This is secant squared x, secant x, and x. Oh, secant x. This is nothing more than an inspired observation. Okay. Look what a clever fellow I am. All right, I took seek an egg to find it by, by itself. And I made something that looks totally fine. Out of it. Or is it? See if I see a use of position you can find this out of it. What's the relationship between the top of that fraction and the bottom of that fraction? Besides the fact that the top of the fraction is the secant x times the bottom of the fraction. There's another important relationship. Right. What's the derivative? Oh. The derivative of secant is secant. This is what makes it clever. This begging for new substitution. So again, B U, this is set up to make the BU work is secant x and x plus secant squared x. The x. 
So this top part here. So this interval was terrible. It's basically this. One over U to U, which is natural law and absolute value equal to C, which is natural law and the absolute value C next. Let's change the concept. Now, this problem is a huge substitution on steroids, right? Because it's not just a huge substitution out of the blue, you had to do a little outbreak manipulation to put it in form where it will yield to a new substitution. So let's write this down actually on the better. So really, my motivation for doing this is to do another problem. Right, seeking the bad, seeking the cubes that we learned from the witness. Actually, let's do this example A. How about this one? Be careful about that. That, that won't work. You can't. So you get the end of the square, it's not the square of the end. It's just answer. Uh, actually, it turns out that even powers of seeking are easy to end, right? Seeking to the four, seeking to the six, they're all easy. The odd powers, they're tricky. Uh, seeking to the first power, super tricky. Uh, how about seeking to the third power? Uh, went back to the theme today. I'm going to try this one about the parts. Now, what's the biggest, ugliest piece of that that you can integrate in your And actually, you like this big piece. So, how does he I mean, I, I don't count this as in my head. It's an unholy mess. Seeking cube, I don't know the answer. I'd like to do better than one. But I certainly could do this, couldn't I? This piece I can do in my head. So I'm going to go dv is secret squared x dx, and u is equal to secret x. So put the parts together. What's the what's the derivative of uh, secant x? Good. And the antiderivative of secant squared, which is the whole point of our adventure, is just called tan of x. Okay, so the parts. So of course I get C to next tan to next. And then I get minus is possible. And it's tan squared x C to x. 
Right, because I've got two tangents. Now, I'm going to watch. Well, let's look at, let's stare at this for a minute. Um, U equal tangent. If U is tangent, what's D you going to be? Secant squared. I don't have two secants in there, right? So that's fine if you work out for me. What if U is secant x? Then DU is going to be secant tangent. So I'm going to have to eat up that secant. And a tangent with my du leaving me with a negative tangent. I don't think that's what. Oh, there is a trig. I guess. See by tell me trig identity that involves this and secant squared. And remember, this is basically sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one. Because you multiply this by cosine squared x, sine squared plus cosine squared. So that means that tangent squared x Notice what's inside the parentheses here is C two x minus C x. So if I do this a little bit more, this is going to be minus integral of C two x. And then I guess it's going to be plus integral of secant x. And let's keep in mind that all of this, all of it is equal to this. This is equal to the integral of secant q x dx. Right? Because this is where we started, secant q, and all this is just a root right here. Now, can somebody tell me why we can now solve this? I've got that, and I know that. Right. So this gives me. So I've got a new equation. Secant x tangent. Plus natural log absolute value of c x plus two x. Is equal to two times the antiderivative of c two x. That's a cotton job. That's that identity over here. And then I'm going to take this over here. And so at the end of the day, here's what I get. Antiderivative of secant cubed x in the tags is equal to one half secant x tangent x uh, 
plus one half natural log and absolute value C X plus B X plus B X. Now, uh, go home and try C in the fifth X, and you will actually buy parts. But to do C in the fifth X, you'll need not only this, but you also need this one that we just derived. To do C in the seven X, you need the answer to C and C and cubed and C in the fifth. And so, so on. But all of them are parts. The odd ones. Let me uh, rephrase all of them can be done by the way. You know the previous ones. Okay. Any questions? Okay, here's one. Okay. Uh, I haven't done one with numbers in it. Um, it is incredibly important when you do use substitutions to change your limits of integration when you do substitution. Right? Don't ever forget to do this. In parts, you do not change the numbers because in parts, it's just a reason. So use substitution requires you to um, change the variables because what you're doing is you're substituting a function for another function and you've got different ranges there. Perhaps. Um, However, for parts, parts is just a rewrite of the same stuff. So the numbers stay the same. This is the integral of 1 to e squared of uh, natural log x one half of part of the Okay. U dv, what should we have? TV? What's the answer? For digging, what do you want to do? X squared. There is no X squared. What about so? Um, Like that. I mean, that would work because when you put these two parts together, you should get back here. Um, I don't think this is what you want but because what's the antiderivative of log x? Right. But what's going to happen here is. Uh, you're going to have, well, I mean, I can do it that way. Um, but the problem is, is to do this, if we hadn't had a previous example, we'd have to go here and bring the other parts together, right? Uh, I mean, the question that you would work if you know what this is. Um, so try it that way. But I'm going to assume that we haven't already done this work, and I don't know what the internet part is. If we do it this way, this is 2 log x over x. Log is very good by the way. 
there's no this any of that magical excellence here because it's been changing it's going to kill us and so what do we get What we get here is x log x on the square minus cross x. The cross x is 2 log x. This is by with 1 to e squared. By the way, Richard, if you knew what the antiderivative of log x is, this one. And I think your suggestion will work very well on this if you happen to be that. So in here, we've got it in the parts again. And I'm going to go 2 log x on this and take x again. So du is 2 over x, x, d is x. This is x, that's the log x squared, by the way, 1 squared, minus 2x log x, by the way, 1 squared, uh, just minus, and then it's minus, it's also like plus, 2. Okay, uh, any questions on that? So finally, what I get is x log x squared plus 2x log x plus 2x all value uh, one to one to each. So let's put this in. I get e squared and log of e squared is 2 squared, which is 4, uh, minus 2 e squared, uh, log of e squared is 2, plus 2 e squared, minus. When I put in 1, it's convenient because the log of 1 is 0. So that's gone, that's gone, and I get 2. So this is 40 squared minus 40 squared plus 50 squared minus 2. So I have 2 e squared. So the moral of the story is uh, remember, so your limits of integration uh, for integration by parts, if all you do is parts in this case. Okay. Any questions on that? So Oh, I'm going to use a, I'm going to use parts and the trick. I'm going to make a trick out of it. Uh, so we'll put this together in this class. Um, give me a positive number, a positive number. Okay. Eli, give me a positive number. What's it? What's it? First. Um, sine or cosine? Sine or cosine? Sine. Uh, 
Um, so um, let's let's find the anti-trip. Let's put u equal. Um, now these kinds of problems, I would consider both of these sort of equally uh, simple with respect to integrating. So I'm going to I'm going to go uh, sine 32x right here and cosine 2x might be v. Uh, so v is one half sine 2x and u is 32 cosine 32. To keep an eye on them, make sure everything stays. So, integration by parts, well, I've got the part of these two. So, I've got one half uh, sine 32x sine 2x minus the crossing. So, it's 16 uh, cosine 32x sine. And again, I'm going to call this I. So now I've gone from cosine with 2 and sine with 32 to uh, cosine with 32 and sine with 2. Well, let's try parts again. And remember, it's important that we stick with our guns here. And so the first time around, I'll let you be the Sine 32 x thing. So I've got to go with the cosine here. Cosine 32 x. And V is going to be sine 2 x dx. So I'll take the derivative of this. If the U is 32 times 16, which is 512, it's negative. That's sine. That's and V is minus one half cosine two x. So what I've got is my integral, my original now equal to one half sine 32x cosine 2x, this bit, minus this product. This product is negative, so it's going to be positive. That's going to be positive 8 uh, cosine 32x. Sine 2x. Five these two minus plus. So that's good. Uh, this cross interval can be positive, so those two things cancel out. This is minus. This is minus. It's actually plus. So the cross interval is plus, but it's minus cross interval. Like minus plus. <laughs> you have to be careful with parts because this kind of thing can happen. So the cross integral is quite right these two. That's a plus. It's minus the cross integral, but minus this thing. So it's actually going to be plus. Um, I guess it's going to be 256. Uh, sine 32x. Okay. Any questions? And this 
is a hope at Sunbury University. Yes, this is 256. So, minus 255i is equal to one half sine 32x cosine 2x plus 8 cosine 32x sine 2x. C. And so my integral. Sine 2x, sine 32x, yes, is equal to, assuming I did everything right, this is minus 510, minus 1 over 510. Uh, uh, sine 32x, uh, cosine 2x. Minus eight over two fifty five um, cosine thirty two x sine two x plus. So there is the integral that you all meant to do, right? So this is. This is integration by parts, and it's another change of tail. Do I understand? This is not the best way to find it. Um, so here's where I sing the phrases of trigonometry. Uh, let me write down some ideas here. Uh, And sign a cosine Okay, so uh, how many of you see this side of here? So yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you may not remember, you call it a counter trick. Uh, you call it counter trick. I know you've seen this one. Um, you've seen sine A plus B is equal to sine A cosine B plus cosine A, sine B, right? These kind of identities. This is where this comes from. It's basically taking these pieces and reverse engineering, right? But how is this relevant to this problem? Let's do this. So I've done this part. So I'm going to do this problem over again. I won't take nearly so long. Which one of these identities one, two, three might be relevant to this problem. Agree, because it's sine cosine fit. So here, my role of A is played by 32x 
and my rule of B is equal to 2x in that algorithm, right? And so this is the integral of one half. Let's see what the formula tells me. It should be sine of a plus b. So it should be sine of 34x. Plus sine of a minus b. Sine of 30x. Right, okay with me? So, what's my antiderivative? Well, I need the antiderivative one half sine thirty four x plus one half sine thirty x. I bet at this point you can just write this down. This is what? Minus 1 over 74 cosine 34x. Uh, and then plus 1 over 60. 74 uh, 68. 1 over 68 sine 34x plus or minus 1 over 60 cosine 30x. Notice this answer and this answer don't look the same, but they vary by a constant. So, Plus half same right, so I must have the following equation one of five ten uh sine thirty two x cosine 2x minus 8 over 255 cosine 2 cosine 32x sine 2x should equal this thing minus 1 over 68 cosine 34x Minus one over sixty cosine of thirty x plus constant. So this crazy thing, this crazy thing, is the same as the constant. By the way, how can I figure out what the constant is? How about plug in zero? That's the easiest thing to do. Here, sine of zero is zero, sine of zero is zero, so we get a zero over here. Cosine of zero is one. Cosine of zero is one. So I would C is equal to um, so, don't ever say I never gave you anything. We have derived through integrating this two different ways everybody's favorite trig identity minus 1 over 510 uh, sine. 32x cosine 2x 
minus 8 over 255 cosine 32x sine 2x is equal to uh, minus 1 over 60 uh, cosine 34x minus 1 over 68 over 60 cosine 30x plus 128 over 4,008. That is a trick I didn't do, but probably you have not seen it. But it falls well. Uh, well, let me say it follows, assuming that I didn't make some kind of cloud where it slipped somewhere along the line. But anyway, well, we'll would you rather use this? These part. By the way, on the final exam, wherever else, I will do these for you for free as well. I'll be happy with the question. Okay, any questions? What is the actual like, initial equation for parts? You need to know that. Like, uh, you need to. And you know what? You can always reverse engineer it too if you want. Right? But what, just remember this what happens is, is you have the integral of f of x, which is prime of x, dx. And what's implicit here is this is the piece that you want to integrate. You want that to be dv is u. So your substitution, kind of substitution, your parts, you want them to be. This. And so this is du, this is v. And so it's uv minus integral of e, which in this case is just f g minus the integral of g f prime minus. I always remember this one. It's the product of these minus the cost. Okay, other questions? <clears throat>